Welcome, Miss Nikki Bracey. Hold on. Are you are you there? Okay. All right, perfect. How's everybody doing? Good. Good, Good morning. Good morning. All right, so Nikki is the social media supervisor at Planet Agency. I sent you all the link um, with the agency and kind of what they do in Baltimore. And she visited the social media class last semester, or last academic year, and it was great. Um, just her sharing her strategy and all of the professional advice that you gave the students. I had to have you come back and speak to this class. So we're just excited and delighted to have you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I always love speaking to um, students who are interested in getting into this field, um, particularly students of color, because I think it's really important for marketing of all industries to be diverse um, and representative of the audiences and communities that businesses are supporting um, and, and people are patroning. So um, thank you guys all for being interested in learning more about social media and what I do. So, um, how would you like me to start? Am I okay to share my screen? Yes, let me just, there we go. I've changed the permissions. You should be good to go. Okay, awesome. Really quick, my class, I just sent a message out. Please go ahead and compose three tweets um, tagging SCOM up and SCOM social during this talk. Great. So, um, as you mentioned, I work at Planet. I'm a social media supervisor and Planet is an advertising agency and we're based here in Baltimore over on Key Highway. Um, we've got about 80 to 85 employees and our whole mission is to be creative change agents for big brave brands. So that means that we are trying to change the status quo, do marketing that is innovative and unique and exciting for brands who are ready to do that, right? Not every company is ready to jump out there and do something unique. Not every company is um, interested in investing, you know, a good amount of money into their marketing. And so those are the types of clients that we tend to go after. Um, a little bit about me. So I am an AKA, I went to Penn State for undergrad, um, where I majored in public relations and uh, theater, actually. And um, then I went on to get my graduate school license um, in a master's of art in management. Um, so I didn't get a social media master's degree or marketing or communications master's. I went the business route for my master's. Um, I am engaged uh, to my longtime fiance, well, longtime boyfriend of, gosh, seven years. Um, I love to do adventurous things like travel. So this uh, coronavirus, the social distancing and not being able to go anywhere has been very hard for me. We've had a couple of huge trips canceled this year. Um, we were supposed to go to South Africa. Um, actually, the week that uh, the lockdown really started, middle of March, um, that got canceled. We were supposed to go on a cruise at the end of the year, so um, that's definitely been rough for me. Um, I love to do things like skydiving. I play the piano, um, and so, you know, I just wanted to introduce myself and show that, you know, uh, I am not just a social media marketer, but um, the, there are other elements of my life, and that actually pours into um, social media for me and how I um, use my own social media and, and the framework that um, I bring to brands is inspired by my own personal life. So a little bit more about Planet really quick. Um, we were founded in 1994 um, by two Baltimoreans as well. One went to Calvert Hall, one went to Loyola. Um, and so it is now one of the largest independent agencies in Maryland. Um, we've got about 29,000 square feet of office space in the heart of downtown Baltimore. However, as you can see, I am working from home. So that's actually been a nice perk and a privilege that uh, quite frankly, a lot of businesses are not able to offer, right? If you're an essential worker, you're not able to work from home. And so that's one of the nice things about having a corporate job. 
um, is that in situations like this, you are able to work from home. This is a privilege. Um, my fiance is an essential worker. He um, actually works for the post office. So, you know, it's been a very different uh, lifestyle that we've had to lead during this coronavirus situation. Um, that number, it says that we are home to over 65 artists, strategists, planners, and buyers, but that number has increased to around 80 or so now. Um, and we won a number of small agency awards from Ad Age. Um, we win awards um, from the Addies pretty much every year for our work. Um, and so, you know, one of the things as you are looking for your careers, um, you want to look for agencies and companies that are doing award-winning work because that's an opportunity for you to do award-winning work. So definitely keep that in mind as you are uh, looking for places to apply to. We do everything at Planet, so not just social media strategy and management, but photography and video, um, design and copywriting services, branding, media planning, media buying, web design, PR, um, SEO, the whole thing. And so what we're able to offer clients is, yes, you can absolutely get social media strategy and management from us, but if you bump that with our other service, you'll have a holistic marketing program um, that will work a lot harder for you, that will be able to measure holistically, um, and that's a huge sell for or pretty much any company um, who is able to spend on their marketing budget. So um, I'm not gonna show this, well, I don't know. I can show this culture video um, just to give you all a little bit of a glimpse into Planet and sort of what a day looks like here. Could you all hear that? Okay, perfect. Um, so that's just a little bit about um, Planet. You probably saw um, we have a coffee shop that we own um, and we also do the marketing for. Um, so that creative cup of coffee, we did all the branding for that. And then I actually do all the social media for that, along with a couple of my other colleagues. It's called Order and Chaos. It's, it's a public coffee shop that's right on Key Highway. Um, but one of the perks is as an employee, you get free coffee from there. And we get to test out different marketing ideas in the coffee shop because we have free reign to do pretty much whatever we want there. So let's talk specifically about social media. Um, I think some of this you all will have covered, but organic social media um, 
includes a number of things that we do in-house. Um, and the first is a social discovery and an audit. So um, whenever we're starting with a new client, we host a discovery session where we're like, okay, what are your goals? What are your priorities? Um, what are you looking to do with social media? How are you looking to connect with your audiences? Who are your audiences? You know, what channels then should we be on in order to reach those audiences? And so that's a uh, ground one kind of basic thing that you have to do with every client in order to set expectations, um, have in-depth conversations about what the client is really looking for. And if you need to, you can also challenge their understanding of social media and how it works so that, again, you're setting expectations for success. We'll also do an audit at that point um, where we're doing an in-depth review of the client's actual social media channels. So what's working? What can be improved? Um, who's actually engaging with the content? Is it your target audience or is there some other subset of people who are actually engaging? And then also, what are your competitors doing? You know, what's working for them? What are some opportunities that they're taking advantage of that you as a, as a company are not? And so we package all of that together and deliver it to them as an audit with some insights and areas for opportunity that they can be thinking about. From there, we move into an actual social strategy. And as I believe you've spoken about in your class, a strategy is really a mission. It's something that solidifies the purpose of your social channels um, and how they ladder back to your brand values and the values and interests of your stakeholders. So a social strategy, any company that does not have a social strategy, that is the most important thing that we can do for them. Because if you're just posting stuff into the void on social media, um, you're not going to get much out of it. And so a social strategy is really important for grounding you. Within a social strategy, we will provide a channel strategy. So you may have talked about this, this in your class. Um, the way people engage on Facebook is not the same way that they'll engage on Instagram. It's not the same way that they'll engage on TikTok. And it's not the same way that they'll engage on LinkedIn. And so you have to look at all of the information that you gathered from the discovery, right? What are they trying to achieve? Who are they trying to talk to? And you determine which channels should this company be on. Um, so for example, if I'm trying to reach um, Gen Z, Right. If I'm trying to reach younger, a younger audience, TikTok is probably going to be in my consideration set. But if I'm trying to reach um, millennial moms, TikTok may not be as much of a priority, but instead Instagram would probably be the number one place that I'm going to be on because um, millennial moms are really, really heavily invested in Instagram. And so um, that's why that first discovery component is so critical because you get an understanding of who the audience are, who the audiences are that we're talking to, and then that all funnels down into your strategy. Also included in a strategy are content pillars. And um, content pillars are themes that your social channel should always focus on. And those themes are based on your brand. Um, and so let's say that I have a brand, uh, I, I'm selling, um, let's say, potato chips, and I have a very family friendly brand. And they, um, I'm talking largely to millennial moms who are looking to um, feed their children um, and you know create a nice, package of meals for their kids every single day, and they don't have a lot of time. They're extremely busy parents. Um, so one of my content pillars might be recipes, right? What are some different things that you can do with chips to uh, create really nice recipes for your kids? Uh, another content pillar, though, might be rest and relaxation, right? Because you're talking to a busy mom. And if your goal is to kind of take the pressure off of this busy mom and she needs an escape and she needs, you know, a resource that she can turn to, one of my content pillars might be rest and relaxation where I talk about self-care um, every Friday and different things. And so, right, that's, that's completely separate from the topic of chips, but it's something that resonates with my audience. So that is something that might be important for me to talk about. And then of course, content planning and creative. So once the strategy is already built out, we will start developing monthly content calendars where we're laying out every single topic, every single post, every single piece of creative, um, and we will design all of that in-house. Does anyone have any questions so far? Okay. So, Three of the key elements of a social strategy are number one, your goals. So you've got to have a clear set of goals and a point of view for your very clearly defined audiences. 
Two, you've got to have those audiences. And we like to get very specific. We like to name her um, Epicurious Emery or, you know, um, Salacious Sandra. We get very specific with who we're talking to and we describe her in a way that's very um, clear and unique to a very specific person so that you can almost see the person as you're creating content. You know exactly who you're talking to. Um, so we like to find out who this person is, what does she want, why does she want it, and how can our brand give it to her through social media. And then brand voice. So who are you? How do you sound? What words do you use? Are you funny? Are you witty? Are you sarcastic? Are you really clinical and serious all the time? Right? Every brand sounds different. Some of you may be familiar with Wendy's, um, the fast food restaurant. And on Twitter, they are cheeky. They're hilarious. They, you know, they do mixtapes and they battle McDonald's and, you know, they're always coming at Burger King and it's fun. You know, it's hilarious, but not every brand can pull that off. Um, and so part of our responsibility is to determine, okay, can our brand pull that off? Is that appropriate for, for who we're talking to and, and the position that we hold in our audience's lives? And if so, then we can have fun with that, that voice. Um, so when it comes to determining our audiences, um, like I said, we like to get specific. And so we use a variety of different research tools, um, everything from Nielsen to Sprout Social. Um, and that that is really helpful because it allows our audience development to be actually rooted in data. So, um, you know, we're not just saying, oh, Wendy's is a fun brand, so let's make the voice fun. We're actually going in and researching our audience so that we can prove our audience actually responds to fun content. So um, some of the things that we look at are demographics. So kind of your basic, how old are they? How much money do they make? Do they have disposable income or are they, you know, counting pennies? Um, are they employed full time? Do they have leisure time? Are they, you know, a stay at home mom, perhaps? Um, how you engage with a stay at home mom versus a really busy corporate person are going to be completely different because they have completely different day to day needs um, and, and schedules. Um, then we're also looking at attitudes. So what do they value as a person? You know, do they care about nature? If so, maybe we're talking about sustainability. Maybe our photos are taken outside, right, in nature because they respond to that type of thing. Um, do they care about um, being reliable and trustworthy? Well, if so, maybe we need to prove that we are a reliable and trustworthy brand. How can we bring that across on social media? Um, psychological drivers, so what are some of the things that um, will make them say, okay, I need to make a purchase or I need to take an action. Um, and then top hobbies. What do they like to do in their spare time? Um, do they like to garden? If so, you know, how can we work that into our content? Is that relevant? Um, are they really interested in home improvement? Um, okay, maybe we have nothing to do with home improvement, but we've got some memes out there that are relevant and tie into, um, you know, redesigning your at home living space, right? Um, so there's all kinds of ways that you can look at what your audience cares about outside of your category and say, well, how can we bring that into our conversation on social media? And then behaviors, again, strategy and what platforms we should be on. We have to look at what platforms our audiences are already on, right? And so if they're heavily indexing for being on LinkedIn, well, maybe that's a place that we need to be spending our time. If they're not really heavily indexing on Twitter, we shouldn't be on Twitter just to be on Twitter, right? That's not an effective use of our time because we're not gonna be reaching as many members of our audience there. So, you know, it's better to go all in on LinkedIn where they're heavily active than it is to be on four different platforms and they're really only active on one. And then also TV consumption insights. So, you know, are they constantly watching TV online? Are they watching TV on the actual television? Are they, um, what shows are they watching? You know, if, if someone is constantly watching, um, I don't know, Power Book 2, you know, how can you work in a meme about Power Book 2 um, into your content, right? If that's something that you know is relevant to your audience, how do you make that relevant to your brand and your social media? 
So some social campaigns that I've worked on over the course of my career, um, <clears throat> you all probably know the, the grocery store Food Lion. And so for some years I was doing the social strategy for Food Lion <clears throat> and coming up with some campaigns for them, which was actually a lot of fun, um, partially because I personally love to work on brands that I'm familiar with and that I know already because there's a level of understanding that I have there. I know I can more easily see, okay, what are your problems? What are, what are the things that you're doing well? Um, and I can bring that level of thought to any engagement that I'm doing with them. So because I had shot that food line before, I was really excited to work with them. And this is one of actually the first clients that I ever worked on uh, in my career. And one of the things that they told us that they wanted to do was they wanted to generate buzz, awareness, and trial of their private label brand, My Essentials. And at the time, My Essentials was brand new. Nobody had heard of it, um, but it was essentially, um, every store has their own private label brand for the most part. Like you can go to Target and find like Target packaged products. You can go to Giant and find, you know, Giant packaged corn and, and and all sorts of stuff and so what they're able to do with that is they're buying the product they're packaging it so they're getting it for cheaper so it's a benefit for them to sell more of their private label brand than it is to sell some of the store or some of the name brands so like instead of selling a bunch of green giant uh green beans they want to sell food line green beans my essential green beans so the problem was that my essentials were good. I mean, they were really, really delicious and they were affordable, but people had no idea they existed. It was a brand new um, private label company. Um, and then their audience was obviously their existing food line shoppers who were mostly middle-class families. Um, and they were in key markets. So from Maryland down to around Florida, um, that's who we were talking to. So he said, okay, people have never tried this product before, but it's actually good. It's cheaper than what they're probably buying. <clears throat> what if we just gave it to them? Like, what if we just found a way to put the product directly into shoppers' hands so they had to try it and we gave it to them for free? So I came up with this concept called Operation Grocery Job. Let's see if this video will work. No, I don't think it will. Um, but essentially what we did is Hmm, it's not playing, but um, essentially what we did is we um, got a truck, we wrapped it, so it was an existing food line truck, we wrapped it in this um, thing that we designed called Operation Grocery Job, and we sent hired food line employees into neighborhoods with like shopping carts full of my essentials and they knocked on every single door in the neighborhood and said hey would you like some free groceries like can we do your grocery shopping today we filmed the entire thing so you've got all these different food line um, workers in their food line branded shirts just flooding the neighborhood um and we captured all that on photo we captured it on video <clears throat> we seeded that all over social media and then we did that in one neighborhood and then we said, all right, if you liked this experience, great. Now you can nominate your neighborhood to be the next neighborhood to get this experience. And so we started fielding all these different nominations, people telling stories about, you know, why their neighborhood deserved to get the next operation grocery job, how their neighborhood comes together in times of trial and tribulation. And we deserve to get a truck full of groceries in our neighborhood. Um, and so we started going city by city, um, we did some in North Carolina, um, some in uh, Richmond, Virginia, and then also some in Baltimore. Um, and we filmed it each time, um, and each time we see it on social, and it was some of the most engaging content that anyone um, had ever engaged with on Foodline channels because it was really interesting. People were excited about the idea of like, oh my gosh, I could win like free groceries. Um, you know, for my entire neighborhood, what a great thing. We um, pitched it to the local media in each town that we went to. So that's a way that we brought in PR. Um, we got people excited and amped, out, amped up about the next um, city that we were going to via email. So we also incorporated email into that. Um, so we were really coming at it from a bunch of different angles, but social media was the main way that we were able to 
um, kind of get the, the word out about this huge initiative that we were doing. Um, and it really drove a lot of um, conversation and goodwill for the brand. If I'm able to get the video to work, I'll send it to you and you can, you know, send it out to the students to watch later. Another campaign I worked on was actually with influencers. So influencers is interesting because that's a nice mix between social media and PR. Um, you pitch an influencer the way that you would pitch the media, but usually what you're asking them to do is to cover your content from a social media perspective, you know, to post on, on their Instagram channels or create a video for YouTube or whatever it might be. So um, we do a lot with influencer relations these days because it's extremely popular. Um, and so, our goal was for this client, Livabode, which is actually a blog owned by a home manufacturing company called Royal Building Products. Um, our goal was to increase web traffic to livabode.com, increase organic search traffic, uh, increase organic social media traffic to the blog by 100%, and to increase influ in, uh, Instagram followers uh, at, at Livabode. So the problem was that we just didn't have enough content um, and we need to find a way for that content to actually reach new people. So we had a problem with generating content and then we had a problem with getting that content out there. And we were talking to homeowners throughout the US and Canada. So we said, okay, what if we had trusted influencers who already have their own communities of people to talk to in the home design space? What if we could get them to both create the content for us and share it? Right? And that would solve both of our problems. That would get us generating content without us having to do it, but it would also um, find a vehicle for which we could get that content out through to larger people who are not already aware of Live Abode. So we built relationships with influencers in every category of the Live Abode blog, um, and they were posted, that content was posted through the entire quarter. So this was Q4, um, so October, November, and December. We um, promoted that content on organic and paid social channels. And then we had each influencer write a blog post for livabo.com. Stories take over <clears throat> on Livabode's Instagram stories. So <clears throat> what we were able to do was generate content for the blog that we did not have to write. We then had them promote that content on their own Instagram channel. So they were getting it out to other people. And then we had them drive people to our Instagram channel to see the Instagram stories take over. So we were able to actually gain some followers off of um, their promotion back to our channels. And that's, that's really what we were trying to accomplish. So right over here, you see this woman kind of wrapping a candle. We had her do a DIY project. She was a crafting blogger um, and so she did all sorts of home DIY tablescapes and really cool things for home entertaining and so we had her create a really beautiful tablescape she designed all of these elements herself then she wrote a blog post explaining how she designed all of those elements what materials did she need what's the step-by-step -step process how long do you let it dry for how do you style it and so people would see this content on her channel and then say, okay, I want the step-by-step because -step I want to recreate that. So they would have to go to liveabode.com to find out how to recreate it. And then we would also promote it on our channel, which you can see here, um, to drive even more people like our own followers to see the blog post. And so that's great for her because she gets some new followers out of it from us who weren't aware of her before. Behind this, um, we did a blog post with another influencer about how to style her front porch for fall. So she had in previous years done these beautiful like front porch, um, this beautiful front porch decor. And so we were like, all right, recreate that again this year, but do it on our blog and do a completely new design. Um, because people are already interested in seeing how you bring your porch designs to life. Like let's reveal that on our blog. And so this is the design she came up with. Um, you can see it's kind of this like cool ombre um, pumpkin design. And in our blog post, she was like, here's how I got the pumpkins for really cheap, right? Because pumpkins can actually be expensive. And so this is a bunch of pumpkins. Um, here's how I dyed and colored them. Here's how I decided how to come up with the idea to do this ombre design in the first place. Um, and so a lot of people drove to our blog to, to figure out how they could bring the same, the same um, front porch design to life. 
So the results from this campaign, we got a 258% increase in overall traffic to liveabode.com, a 798% increase in organic search referral traffic, and a 142% increase in organic social referral traffic. So if you remember, the goal was just to increase it by 100%, uh, and we multifold. Um, a 223% increase in pages. So that means that people were coming um, blog posts found from one of the influencers, but then they were going to other pages, right? They were going and seeing other blog posts and reading other content, which is great. That's what you want. Um, our social media followers grew by 234%. We got 516 new email signups. So that's people saying, okay, I wanna get your emails on a regular basis. And we won a Public Relations Society of Maryland chapter award for this program. So this is the type of program that we would consider to be a case study. It's something that I put in my portfolio as an example of a successful campaign that I came up with, that I executed, and that drove actual tangible results for our client. Another uh, brand that you all may be familiar with is Utz that we've worked with. And Utz came to us with kind of a different problem. They just wanted to have content created. They were like, we don't have the time, but we need, I mean, we have a thousand different products, a thousand different types of chips, pretzels, cheese curls. We've got to improve the quality of our content and we've got to get more of it out there. And so um, Utz had a lot of different um, things to promote and they didn't really have the team in place to do it. And so they were like, we just want someone who can like take this over for us and handle it. Um, and we were talking to diehard Uts fans who are typically right here in Baltimore. Baltimore is the one place in which Uts is actually out, out um, profiting every single other competitor. Um, you guys have probably all heard of Uts, Eaten Uts, Love Uts. Um, here in Baltimore, Uts is just huge. And then we were talking to middle class families, specifically moms, um, who are doing all of the grocery shopping for their, their households. So what we ended up doing was creating monthly content calendars. I'll let this play. So um, we ended up creating monthly content calendars for us where we were testing different types of content to find out, okay, what does our audience respond to best? Do they like videos? Do they like graphics? Do they like photos? And that's research that you can do in advance, but us hadn't done it and they wanted us to start right away. So we used social as a way to do some of that audience research, which is um, one of the actual really great things about social media is that you can test pretty much anything. Um, and using social media as a test and learn situation is actually the best way to use social media. What you want to be doing is um, every time you're putting a piece of content out there, you're looking and saying, okay, how did this perform? Did it perform well? Did we get less engagement than we typically get? All right, why might that be? Is it because we posted it at the wrong time? Is it because um, this is not really a medium that our audience is interested in, right? If I'm talking to a busy mom, do they really have time to watch video? Or is a static image better for them? Um, and so as you're just testing and learning, you're refining uh, your understanding of your audience and what they wanna see moving forward. And so we did a variety of static and video content. So this was just something that we shot. I'll play this one more time. Um, <clears throat> Uts had this concept, the crunch that connects us all. And it was at an interesting time um, when, you know, there's a lot of division in the country and we wanted to just show a lot of different um, people loving Uts chips. And um, so this was a very short, super simple thing that we shot actually in our office um, in probably just a couple of hours and cut together for social media. So that was super simple and super small, but what it showed was different types of people of different ages, races, backgrounds, sizes, eating such a huge variety of Uts chips. So at the same time that we were able to talk about the diversity of the people who enjoy Uts, we were also able to talk about the diversity of the products that Uts actually puts out there. 
Um, one of the things that we created was Utz Art. So we played around with this of actually making art out of the product. So those are actual um, popcorn, Utz popcorn and cheese curls. Um, this is popcorn and pretzels and chips to create this kind of beachscape. Um, and we knew we were talking to moms who have younger kids. So this was kind of fun content that um, was able to speak to some of the different things that were going on summertime um the baseball season which is really big for us they do an mlb partnership every year and so we were able to merge the product with these timely things in this sort of fun kind of childish um execution that spoke to moms really well we also did a father's day contest um so because parents are a big uh, topic for us and particularly moms recognizing Father's Day was kind of an obvious um, <clears throat> responsibility of ours um, because what are moms doing they're planning what they're gonna do with the kids for Father's Day uh, to surprise the, the dads of the family so um, we actually launched a huge giveaway for Father's Day um, all you had to do was like the post leave a comment and share your best memory with your dad or guardian or someone who was in a parent role. <clears throat> um, and we were going to pick a random winner to win this prize pack. And that was um, a couple of new products like the smoke and sweet kettle classic chips and then some classics like the crab cheese balls, the pork rinds. Um, and so we shot this image in this kind of like man cave sort of style um, room that really felt kind of manly. Um, we put like this toy car there. I don't know. Um, we had like a football helmet in the back. It was just kind of supposed to scream like super manly. Um, and this actually ended up being one of their most engaged with photos um, of all time. Um, at that time, it, they've since had more, but it got um, almost 600 entries just on Facebook. We also ran this on Instagram um, and on Twitter. So it got a ton of engagement. Um, and, you know, people love to win. <laughs> people love to win free stuff. So, you know, sometimes you're kind of just thinking, all right, how can I get my product into new people's hands? How can I get my messaging shared out there? Sometimes a contest is the best way. So one of the other things that we would do for us is product launches. They were constantly coming out with new flavors or new ideas. And so what you just saw was how we launched uh, the pub sticks in a new resealable bag. So, I mean, we've all eaten chips before and you open a huge bag of chips and you can only eat but so many chips at one time. So you've got to roll it up. You've got to get a chip clip, right? You've got to keep the chips fresh for as long as possible. So us ended up launching these pub sticks in a bag that actually closes the way a Ziploc bag would so that you don't have to do all of that. And you know that you can keep the chips fresh or the, the pretzels fresh for a really long time. So this is how we launched that. So very simple, right? Like things don't need to be super complicated. What we were promoting is a resealable bag. It's not, you know, the most exciting thing in the world, but it's functional. And so all we wanted to do was show the function in a very easy to understand way of, listen, go buy these pup sticks because they're now in a much uh, better bag for, you know, keeping them and preserving them long term. Um, we did videos around their new Red Hot Crunchies where we had a bunch of redheads eat the Red Hot Crunchies on camera. Um, and, you know, there was just kind of like a fun play on this, this whole red concept. Um, and then we just did some like fun content, like Smile, It's Friday and Cheese Curls Exist. And we had like a smiling cheese curl. So it's important to always do um, a variety of different types of content in the sense of everything can't be self-promotional. Everything can't be about a product. If you're constantly pushing product, pushing product, pushing product, it gets so boring and one dimensional and people start to tune out. But if you do things like the smile, it's Friday, that's just something fun that people can share that people can comment on um, that people can say, cool, you just, you know, you just did something fun to brighten my day. It's, it's you weren't trying to sell me something. Um, but you might then say once you see this, oh, I could go for some cheese curls, you know, but it's very subtle. 
Um, so I do want to show this video. Let's hope that this one plays. Um, this was, this is actually one of the, I was, I think in my first year of my career when this came out, I did not work on this, but this um, campaign has really stuck with me because it is one of the best campaigns that I've ever seen done on a huge uh, international scale. And it was for Jay-Z's book, Decoded. Um, and this is really an awesome campaign because it showcases pretty much every element of marketing coming together to promote this one thing, to get this book out there, to get people talking about it. They use social media, they use guerrilla marketing, they use um, advertising, they use PR, they use literally everything. So I'm going to show you guys this campaign case study. Bing, Microsoft's search engine, came to us to drive trial of Bing search and maps and increase their relevance with a young audience. At the same time, we knew that Jay-Z would soon be launching his autobiography, Decoded. With one big idea, we harnessed this epic moment in pop culture, connected our client to a new demographic, and gave millions a reason to use Bing. We started by putting every page of Jay-Z's book out in the world every day for a month prior to the book's release. But the pages weren't just randomly placed. Every page's location was inspired by the story on each page, putting Jay-Z's entire biography in context. Fans could actually walk through Jay-Z's life right where it happened, finding pages in 13 major cities in the US and abroad, searching for everything from huge iconic billboards to unique collectible items. And if the media didn't exist near Jay-Z's life landmarks, we created it, taking the campaign to places money just can't buy. Gucci made custom jackets stitched with a page. A Cadillac wrapped with pages paid homage to the birthplace of New York hip hop. A page about Big Pimpin covered the bottom of the Delano pool. Even a bronze plaque was installed in the Marcy Projects where Jay-Z spent his childhood. We let the story on each page determine each location. The unique pages covered hundreds of thousands of square miles. And as they were unveiled around the world, Bing tied every element of the campaign together with an integrated online game that directed fans to each page on the streets. Clues to the page locations were released daily through Facebook, Twitter, and radio. And every day for a month, millions of people gathered to solve the latest clues, guiding them to the exact street locations on Bing search and maps. Documenting and claiming the pages they found. The unique framework allowed anyone, anywhere, to walk the same streets and find a page. And over the course of the month-long campaign, they chased fame of their own as they assembled the book digitally at bing.com slash jay-z before the hardcover hit stores. Every single piece of the campaign was woven together with Bing technology to allow fans to experience his story. Average player engagement on our website was over 11 minutes. Jay-Z's Facebook followers grew by 1 million. And Decoded hit the bestsellers list for 19 straight weeks. OJZ's success was covered by every major news outlet, every major cultural influencer. Even other celebrities weighed in. Part of the pop culture conversation. In only one month, Bing saw an 11.7% increase in visits. Entering the global top 10 most visited sites for the first time and earning 1.1 billion media impressions. <laughs> Bing, Microsoft search engine. So that was a, a really great example of just, I mean, you can see all of the different elements that they use to tie. Um, everything together to create a really impactful campaign that even made Bing relevant. I mean, I don't search on Bing and I don't think most of you search on Bing. Like I only use Google. Um, but you can see that that really drove a lot of participation on their site, which was huge. And then of course it also did a great job of promoting the book. So what does a day in the life of a social media supervisor actually look like? Um, it's pretty different every single day, but I'm doing everything from, Community management. So I'm, if you've ever um, messaged a brand on Facebook or Instagram or you've tweeted at a brand and they've replied back to you, that's community management. So I'm that person replying back um, on behalf of the client. 
Um, we do a lot of status meetings, especially now that we're working virtually. Everything is a Zoom meeting. Everything is a huge conversation. Um, and so status meetings are really important because we do them internally in order to go through every single project that's happening, every single campaign. Where does it stand? Does anyone need anything? Um, are we on track to deliver on time? Um, but then we also do them with the client because sometimes you need things from the client and you like to keep the relationship going with your, your company or your client. I'm regularly drafting content. Every single month, we're drafting new content for subsequent months. Um, might be managing ads. Um, we do run, we have a whole paid social department um, who really runs that, but a lot of times I'm running and managing ads as well for some of my clients. Um, more community management because that is constant. We are always doing community management. Our goal is always to respond to customers as soon as possible, but at the most within an hour. Um, and that is not just important because <clears throat> it's good customer service, but also because the algorithms in the social um, media world will ding you if you're not getting back to people. So um, being timely and responsive from a customer service perspective is really important. Pitching influencers, as I said. Um, right now, I'm actually working with a rice brand called Success Rice, where they boil, you boil the rice in a bag. So it's really easy, like you can't mess it up, which you can easily mess up a lot of other rices. Um, but this is in a bag. And so you just kind of boil it for 10 minutes as opposed to the 20, 25 minutes that most rice takes, um, and you're done. And so we're talking to influencers now. We actually just signed a, a bunch of contracts with a bunch of different influencers around, all right, how do we bring that story to your, your followers so that they can make amazing dishes in half the time? Um, and then reporting, you know, data is really, really important in social media. A lot of people don't realize how much numbers uh, is a part of my job, but we do have to look at analytics. We have to look at percent increases and percent change and things. We have to look at, um, you know, how well something is performing from a numeric standpoint because we can we can't just say, oh, it like seemed like it did pretty well. Like we have to be able to say, no, last time these were the numbers. This time these are the numbers. What is that percent change, um, and how can we increase that percent change if it's a positive? percent change and how can we decrease it if it's a negative percent change. So data and analytics is a pretty big part of our everyday job. So what questions do you all have? Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. When you were like in your college years, how did you prepare yourself for your career path? Um, that's a good question. So one thing is um, getting to know your professors. A lot of times professors will have connections to um, other companies that are looking for, you know, maybe an intern or um, something like that, or, you know, they'll know of programs um, like externships and different things that, that people aren't necessarily putting out there. Um, on the internet for anyone to, to apply to. So, you know, talking to your teachers about what you're interested in and making sure that you're, you're doing well. Um, writing workshops are good to do um, if you are, especially if you're not a strong writer. Social media and PR, all of that's pretty much a lot of writing. You've got to be able to write the social copy. You've got to be able to respond to customers. So, you know, any type of writing workshops you can do. Um, networking. So, you know, I would go to job fairs in college. Uh, if I could, I would um, reach out to people on LinkedIn um, and say, you know, hi, I am a student. I am interested in your field. Uh, I'm also interested in your company. I would love to set up an informational interview with you whenever you have time. Um, back then, you know, we would say, like, can we grab coffee or something? Um, but today, you know, it's like, can we can we just chat over Zoom um, when you have 15 to 30 minutes that I can just ask you some questions? And then, you know, when you come to that interview, if, if someone grants you the interview, um, you need to come with a bunch of questions. You need to come with research about them and about um, – <clears throat> The company that they work for and and get all of the the questions answered that you need in order to know whether or not you would like to apply for a job there but that's also like a mini interview right like if you impress that person they might be like hey by the way like we're looking for interns right now it's an unpaid internship but hey you should apply i think you're really smart or you're really um driven whatever it might be 
um, and you can actually get an opportunity out of that. That's not the goal and you know, that's not guaranteed, but if you do a great job with those informational interviews, um, you can, you can actually get an opportunity out of those. Um, and a lot of people get nervous about reaching out to people on LinkedIn, but that was actually the original intention of LinkedIn. It was a professional social network. So you were supposed to find people, um, who could work in your field or could help you in some way with your professional endeavors and respectfully reach out to them and ask for a little bit of their time. Um, <clears throat> most people will do it because they're like, Hey, like, I don't know, you're kind of stroking their ego. Like, wow, you really want to talk to me about my career? Like, sure, I'll give you 15 to 20 minutes to, to ask me some questions, you know, no problem. Um, most people will do it. Some people won't. Some people are simply too busy. Some people are not good at checking their LinkedIn messages. So if you don't get a response, you know, don't take it too personally. But um, if you reach out in a respectful manner, um, if you are clear about your intentions, right, like make it a very short message. Listen, I'm a student. I'm interested in going into this field. Uh, I've been following your career and I would love to have 15 minutes of your time just to ask you some questions about how you broke into the business. Please let me know if you're available. Most people will say yes. On that note, um, because this class ends at 1050, Nikki, would you be willing to connect with students here um, via LinkedIn for further questions? Is that something you could share with us, like your LinkedIn? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you guys can find me on LinkedIn. Um, it's slash in slash and Bracy. Um, I'm pretty sure this is still my picture. Um, you can also find me on Instagram um, at Nick Bracy. Either one of those is fine um, to reach out if you have any further questions. Sorry, I assumed it went till 11. <laughs> No, that's all right. And um, if you guys have to go, you can. We can stay on if you still do have questions, but I wanted to um, let students know who wanted to maybe connect with you directly how to do yeah. so. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, sure. One more question. Um, could you explain again the, um, I think I missed what that home, was it a home decor? Mm -hmm. um business what they mm -hmm. did with the influencers so yeah. Yeah. so we had um that company has a blog and the blog is called live abode <clears throat> and so we create content on that blog around different areas diy home design entertaining all that kind of stuff so we partnered with different influencers who could create that content for us um, and then, um, so they did a little project, like one person did a project where she created like a home tablescape. Another person did a project where, um, she created that really nice porch. And so she wrote a blog post for us. All of them wrote a blog post for us. Then they promoted the blog post on their channels. So the blog post might've said, here's how I bought the pumpkins for the porch. Here's how I came up with the design. Here's how you can recreate this design. And that all lived on our blog. So if you saw the picture of the porch and you were like, wow, that's really nice. I want to recreate that on my porch. You had to go to our blog to do that. Okay. Got it. So based, so, okay. So they, you uh, reached out to them to do that DIY. You shared it on their, on that business's platform, which drove yep, people exactly. to come there and look at this. Okay. Cool. Exactly. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, is your organization, uh, do you, does your organization have any internships available at the time? So right Even now we the don't. Pandemic? Yeah, right now we don't just because of the pandemic. Um, because you would just be like at home with no one to really help you. Um, once the pandemic is over, though, we are going to, of course, open our internships back up. The way our internships typically work, we do unpaid internships during the fall and the spring semesters. And those are, um, it's kind of like at your schedule. So like, if you can only do two days a week for four hours, and that works for us, then that's okay. Um, we try to do at least three days a week, though. Um, so that's in the fall and the spring. And then our summer internship is paid and it's full time. So you're there from nine to five every single day and you're working on clients like in and out as if you're just a part of the team. So me personally, that's always the preferable, like that's the internship that I would go for is the summer one. Um, but right now because of the pandemic, we're not, we're not doing anything. Any other questions? Questions about even just like 
a career in this industry. Um, Nikki, can yeah. you hear me? Oh, okay, someone in the chat asked, what do you think is the most challenging part of executing a campaign? Um, staying on budget, honestly, is probably the hardest thing. Most clients don't have enough money for what they want to do. And you have to find a way to um, get the, goal, the results that they want and meet the goals that they want on, you know, a smaller budget sometimes. And the budget includes not just hard costs like paying the influencers, it also includes your time. So if I am spending a ton of time learning about a new idea for this campaign that I've never done before, that adds to the cost of the project. Um, so a lot of times the biggest challenge is, is not getting it done, it's just getting it done on or under budget. And that's how an agency makes money, right? By doing things in less time than uh, they said it would take. All right, I think that's the last question. Let's be sure there are a lot of thank yous and positive comments in the chat, Nikki. Look at those in there, but those of you who are still on the call, let's be sure to thank our guest speaker for being with us and just sharing her, her time, her professional advice. Thank yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. Appreciate it. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. And Nikki, I will be inviting you back. Uh, okay. Semester. <laughs> yeah, of course. That sounds great. All right. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.